Okay, uh, I'm ready to start. It's very uh, good to be able to uh, <clears throat> make this presentation uh, today. I uh, let me see whether I can just go back. Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> I gave a, a presentation at the uh, Nexus conference uh, in Munich a couple of uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and I was looking forward to spending a, a few days in Paris this time. But unfortunately, that's not worked out. Uh, hopefully, next time. Uh, when I gave uh, my talk last time, uh, I described a discovery uh, technology that we have, which is called Mosaic, which uses micelles to find uh, out uh, the sequences and structures of uh, potential cyclic peptides, uh, which can bind to receptors on the cell surface or other uh, types of protein receptor. And uh, this uh, gave rise to um, some uh, cyclic peptides which were able to uh, halt the progress of um, rheumatoid arthritis in uh, models and uh, in fact it had a, quite a, a significant effect on the uh, uh, bone erosion and all of this was due to uh, molecules which we had discovered which had this basic framework structure so this is uh, a, a, a cyclic peptide um, in a planar form, um, which was derived as a result of uh, the work which we did looking at the way in which these micelles uh, with amino acids on their surface interacted with receptors, and then we transformed those into cyclic uh, planar uh, peptides, uh, which were able to bind to the receptors in the same way. And so here you can see one, uh, it's a, a a decimer, um, it's got a, a couple of uh, uh, fatty acid uh, chains which are surrounded by um, cyclodextrin ring in, in order to increase the rigidity and then of course you've got these uh, cross ring hydrogen bonds. So this is a very rigid structure and I'm going to spend the rest of the time today uh, extolling the virtues of these cyclic peptides as, uh, as drug uh, uh, agents particularly for interacting and binding with proteins and altering the behavior of these proteins. And I want to start off by I, um, uh, just uh, 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 people ask the question they say cyclic peptides this cyclic peptides that there's a lot of uh, uh, work which has been done showing that cyclic peptides are uh, suggesting that cyclic peptides could have a very good um, uh, uh, biological effects uh, in nature and certainly we've seen that but I want to start off just by uh, uh, explaining why it is or taking one example of why it is that cyclic peptides are actually uh, very good uh, things to work with and I want to show that cyclic peptides uh, are actually very very good because of their rigidity and their structure are very good at uh, binding to linear peptide chains uh, uh, so peptide loops on proteins so why might we want to do that well of course we've just had a talk on uh, <coughs> GPCR and so uh, one of the things that would be very interesting to find things uh, to specifically find things which could bind to the loops on uh, uh, GPCR in order to change their activity and uh, one of the things that uh, could do this very well I'm going to say is the cyclopeptides which we'll talk about um, so what we did is an experiment, a very simple minded experiment, where we took a linear peptide and we took a cyclic peptide and we thought, uh, well, let's see, we can uh, choose some amino acid residues so that we can match these up so that they will, um, <coughs> uh, uh, if there's a binding opportunity there, then they will be able to take that. So uh, we had... Um, <coughs> Uh, positive arginine matched with a, a negative uh, glutinate. We had uh, lipophilic leucines, and then we have uh, the tryptophan uh, interacting with the tyrosine. So th the idea was that um, these should bind with each other, and let's measure the uh, interaction of the binding. And uh, the way that this is done is just by looking at the fluorescence enhancement as a result of bringing the tryptophan and the tyrosine together. Uh, but what we wanted to do 
uh, was actually to compare this situation uh, with an ideal, uh, uh, identical situation where you've got the same sequence of, uh, of uh, amino acids and the same opportunity for interactions, but just in the form of a linear peptide compared with the cyclic peptide. And again, uh, what we do is we would look at the uh, interactions of these two by uh, monitoring the, uh, uh, the uh, fluorescence enhancement that you get when you bring them together in solution. And uh, <clears throat> the result that we get is this. So here we can see very good fluorescence enhancement when you've got the uh, cyclic peptide binding to the, uh, binding to the uh, linear peptide. Uh, and this is uh, uh, sequence specific. So if you take a sequence where you've got the same uh, aromatics, but uh, the other um, uh, amino acid residues are completely changed, then you can see that you get very little uh, interaction. When you compare this with what you see with a linear peptide, then uh, it's clear that uh, the cyclic peptide wins out. You've got uh, a, a lot less uh, of an interaction uh, and even less when you've got the, uh, the non-specific um, uh, peptide. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> in fact, this was just part of a larger experiment where we looked not only at things which match completely here, uh, <clears throat> Uh, with the um, uh, with the cyclic peptide, but also when there are mis partial mismatches as well as complete mismatches, and as you can see the difference between the sort of binding that you get when you're working with a cyclic peptide and the binding that you get when you're working with a linear peptide is very uh, uh, is is very obvious. So <clears throat> hopefully I've convinced you that uh, cyclic peptides are a worthwhile approach. <clears throat> to uh, develop uh, in order to find things which uh, can bind to uh, biological structures on the surface of proteins. However, um, what I've been putting forward so far is a, a rather simplistic um, uh, uh, a, a rather simplistic view of the way in which uh, amino acids uh, residues can interact, peptides can interact. Because uh, the thing is that, um, okay, you've got one amino acid uh, residue interacting with another amino acid residue. The problem is that there's a lot of redundancy that uh, this amino acid could bind not only to that, but some others, and we'll see that in a moment. So that uh, you'll actually have very poor specificity. And the next slide that shows it here. So here you've got your your uh, your peptide and another peptide here. And uh, <clears throat> so this peptide could bind to these amino acids in that way. Just uh, looking at this. Uh, uh, stylistic uh, uh, representation of it, but they could just as easily bind to a completely different set in a different order um, uh, with the same uh, level of intensity. So this, you know, this simplistic idea of uh, one uh, uh, amino acid residue binding to uh, another amino acid residue doesn't really serve us very well in real life, and it's not the way, in fact, that nature um, arranges the uh, the binding interactions uh, between uh, uh, proteins and proteins proteins or between proteins and peptides. Um, uh, what nature does is it takes advantage of the fact that amino acids are multifunctional and they are multitasking. In other words, amino acids can do lots of different things and they can do these things all at the same time. Uh, so here we can see uh, this is one uh, residue here, and uh, 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 an amino acid, as we as 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 we know, although we may not have looked into this in great detail, uh, we know that amino acids can, under certain circumstances, interact at the same time with two different other uh, um, amino acid residues. And in fact, of course, this happens a great deal in uh, nature, and this is the way in which nature. Um, is able to ensure the specificity of its uh, interactions with this relatively simple and in some cases redundant set of uh, amino acid residues uh, which, um, uh, which uh, form the proteins that uh, we work with. Um, so that uh, instead of that simplistic one-to-one -one interaction, this is a, 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 a representation of an ideal way in which proteins or so peptides can interact with each other uh, so that every amino acid residue can bind to uh, two uh, uh, other amino acid residues by what I call bidentate uh, ligand interactions. So here you have one amino acid here and you've got these two both interacting with that same uh, residue in a bidentate, so a, a two-toothed, a two-pronged uh, interaction. Um, let's have a look at that in the real world, and I've just 
picked up one example here, and this is actually, uh, this, is, uh, this is SARS. It's not SARS-CoV-2, it's SARS-CoV-1, uh, but actually uh, this part of the molecule is very, very similar. And so what we're looking at here is uh, the ACE2 receptor, the ACE2 cell receptor, and as we know, uh, that binds to a loop on uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And what I've done is I've just taken the loop itself and left the rest of the, uh, the spike protein away. And <clears throat> what you can see here is uh, three examples actually of uh, a bidentate ligand interaction. So here you've got your uh, an arginine uh, interacting with a uh, glutamate here and so you've got two uh, uh, bonds uh, forming uh, between the two uh, amino acids. But here's more interesting, here you've got a tyrosine and that is forming bonds with two different amino acids as we, as we uh, spoke about. So here you've got uh, a serine and this is, uh, uh, I can't see very well but this is probably another um, aspartate. And of course, uh, the whole of the uh, interaction is itself a bidentate ligand because this uh, a bidentate ligand interaction, because this loop is not binding to the uh, alpha helix just by a single uh, interaction, but it's binding by two interactions uh, together. And this is something which uh, it, uh, introduces uh, specificity into the interaction. Um, it also uh, uh, makes the interaction stronger. It makes the interaction more stable as well. So uh, let's just uh, uh, look at a little bit more about that. So the question is, how can we ident uh, uh, implement uh, that uh, bidentate ligand principle uh, with the uh, cyclic peptides? So here are a couple of, this just reminds us the cyclic peptides that we're looking at and the amino acids are all facing up uh, 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 on one side of the plane of the, um, uh, of the cyclic peptide. This is what they look like uh, in a, uh, in a computer uh, graphics uh, representation, you can see the cross-ring uh, hydrogen bonds here. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually an FC receptor. So what you can see is you've got uh, uh, beta-pleated sheets, you've got loops, and you've got uh, alpha helices. And basically that's all that you have in any protein. So if you can cover all of those three different types of uh, structure in a protein, and if you can find some way of binding to those, then basically you've got uh, 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 the whole of uh, protein, protein interactions covered. So um, uh, the cyclic peptides that I've described are actually absolutely perfect for that sort of uh, interaction because of the spacing, uh, because the spacing of the cyclic peptides is absolutely identical to the spacing between uh, residues that you want to interact with in the sort of structures that uh, you find in protein. So here you've got an alpha helix. And here you can see, uh, if you look at the side of the alpha helix, that's the distribution uh, uh, as you go for a couple of turns. That's the distribution of the amino acids uh, on the surface of the alpha helix. And if you take a cyclic peptide, then uh, it interleaves, it just uh, um, uh, fits perfectly uh, onto the uh, alpha helix. And as you can see, there's a lot of interleaving there. So there's a lot of opportunity for bidentate ligand interaction here, here, here uh, and here. So, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the peptide actima is, <coughs> uh, the peptide actima is ideally suited for binding an alpha helix. And uh, we can just see that here. Here's a very simple model. So this is uh, what um, uh, uh, an alpha helix might look like with two arginines and two glycines. So if you want to design an alpha helix, uh, sorry, if you want to design a cyclic peptide to bind to that, okay, you have some lipophilic residues here which can interact with the glycine, basically the absence of residue there. And then you have some um, negatively charged residues there which will interact with the arginines. And uh, uh, what I want to do is to just uh, emphasize that you, the spacing is absolutely perfect. You've got your arginine there, and then you've got two carboxyls here. You've got another arginine there, two carboxyls there. So without having to um, uh, worry about the, uh, uh, the configuration of the cyclic peptide, it just presents these uh, residues in exactly the right place, right, exactly the right position to interact with the uh, residues, whatever they are on the, um, uh, on the uh, alpha helix. So, uh, it'll do that with the beta pleated sheet as well. Uh, and of course, as we've seen, uh, it'll do that with the loops. 
Now then, uh, loops uh, are uh, very interesting. Uh, if we're going to go back to uh, say something like uh, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV, because um, it's via these loops that the uh, COVID, uh, uh, that the, uh, the spike protein binds to its receptors. So we've seen one example of that already. We had a look at the tyrosine and the um, uh, glutamate there binding to uh, this part of the uh, receptor and then there's another loop here which binds to the other end. So if we can find um, uh, an aptima, a cyclic peptide which can bind to this and which can bind to that, then uh, we can find something certainly which will be uh, able to inhibit that uh, interaction or uh, at the very least could be um, a diagnostic uh, for detection of the uh, spike protein on the virus. This is what the loop looks like. And if you look at the, uh, 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 the loops on the spike protein, you can see that you've got uh, amino acid residues which are distributed throughout there, which are just ready for binding to a cyclic peptide. Uh, and uh, it, it, this is a computer graphics representation of an aptima that we have designed, especially in order to bind to that loop. And what I want to show you here is the way in which you've got uh, 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 an extensive lattice, an extensive network. You've got this asparagine here, binding to that asparagine, binding to that asparagine, uh, binding to uh, uh, this uh, glutamate, which then binds to that uh, lysine, which then binds to the serine. Then you've got a, a, a backbone interaction. So you've got uh, uh, you've got a, 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 you've got a um, a network here, which means that you've got something which is very much more stable than you would if you just had monodentate liquids. Um, <clears throat> how to choose those uh, different uh, amino acids? Uh, well, we have uh, uh, <clears throat> conducted a lot of data mining and uh, we've been looking at the interactions of amino acids uh, in proteins which interact with each other. And we have uh, established a database which demonstrates uh, which particular amino acids, this is blinded of course, um, uh, which particular amino acids uh, are best at forming pairs with uh, two others. So we, we have something which tells us all the bidentate ligand interactions which uh, can take place and which are the ones which are most favored. In fact, we've managed to crystallize this into a little uh, uh, table here. And the reason why I call this in cerebro is because you don't, once you've got to this stage, you don't actually have to look at uh, um, uh, you don't have to go back to the computer and do your calculations. You can just memorize this and, uh, uh, and, and pick out for every particular amino acid which is the best one uh, to choose in order to get this uh, bidentate ligand, uh, uh, ligand interaction. And if you show me any, um, uh, any protein, uh, uh, I could, on the back of the envelope, design you a cyclic peptide which will bind to it. What the, just wanted to finish off with one last point because what's very important is uh, to get the uh, uh, the specificity right. So you don't want to choose. Let's supposing that you've got an amino acid here and you want to find out uh, what the best uh, pair is to uh, interact with. You've got uh, uh, the arrows here show the strength of interaction, but if you uh, uh, but if you uh, <coughs> uh, were to say, okay, this binds most strongly to that, actually that one uh, would not be uh, give you a high degree of specificity because this binds even more strongly to that one. So if you want to choose a, uh, a, a, a pair, what you've got to do, for example, this one is the one that you want to choose that because this binds more strongly to that than anything else. So what you've got to do is to choose pairs not on the basis of which binds most strongly to a particular amino acid, but which pair binds least strongly to any other. And the data in our database that we have created uh, uh, gives you this as well. So that's the way in which you can get the uh, specificity that you want to, uh, uh, that, that you need. And this just shows, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, this is the last slide. So this just shows how you uh, how, how that works out. And we've uh, got an atom which binds to COVID-1, which has been targeted to COVID-1. But if you look at uh, the loops on uh, uh, other parts of the COVID uh, spike protein or on SARS, then you can see that, that you've got background uh, uh, binding at all. So in conclusion, the uh, cyclic peptide combined with the data mined by dentate ligand preferences gives you a prediction of structure which is both increased instability and increased specificity. And uh, because you're working with cyclic peptides, it's something that you can 
uh, uh, synthesized very quickly once you've designed it, and uh, <coughs> uh, then you can validate the models uh, in uh, systems which are, um, uh, oh, for example, uh, the, the last uh, uh, lecture, that will be a very good uh, model uh, to validate these systems in. Thank you very much. <laughs>